Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and we continue with the series on Leonidas Polk by examining the warrior bishop's journey from the Battle of Shiloh to the Battle of Perryville. Polk's resignations were met with arguments from Davis to stay in the army and help the Confederate cause. Polk relented and continued at his post. 1861 concluded, and 1862 emerged with Polk busy coordinating troops in the Western Theater. Some of his military duties was to obstruct the Mississippi River by placing obstructions in the waterway, placing an immense chain across the river, and then installing torpedoes. He told Fanny that the Union gunboats would have a most difficult time coming down the river with his obstructions in place. The end of 1861 and the beginning of 1862 saw Polk design his own flag. He created a Christianized battle flags of his own design from Memphis. Priced at $15 each, the flags bore a St. George's cross red with a blue field sprinkled with 11 white stars, one for each Confederate state that Polk deemed deserving. Kentucky and Missouri dithered on the north-south border he regarded as unworthy stars. Gideon Pillow and Polk were in heated quarrels on a regular basis, eventually leading to Pillow resigning after not receiving the rank of Major General, which he had been given by the state of Tennessee, but when brought into Confederate service, he had been brought in on the level of Brigadier General. January 1862 brought about serious troubles for the Confederacy. On January 19th, Confederate commanders George Crittenden and Felix Zollicoffer were defeated at the Battle of Mill Springs, and the latter being killed in the engagement. The far right wing of the Confederate defensive line in the West was compromised. Additionally, Ulysses S. Grant was making preparations to use the Cumberland and Tennessee rivers to invade Tennessee. Albert Sidney Johnston had ordered Polk to construct a fort across from Fort Henry on the Tennessee River. It was completely unfinished, prompting Johnston to blurt out to his staff, It is most extraordinary. I ordered General Polk four months ago to at once construct those works, and now, with the enemy upon us, nothing of importance has been done. It is most extraordinary. Most extraordinary. Their friendship was seeming to wear thin. With the Confederate defensive line smashed by the capture of Fort Henry and Donelson, Southern forces fled from Kentucky, deeper into Tennessee and Mississippi. However, Polk's garrison at Columbus was still remaining. However, it would not stand for long. General P.G.T. Beauregard ordered an inspection of Polk's Columbus fortifications, and the result was not good. Beauregard informed him in Jackson, Mississippi, that with his troops imperfectly organized and with lines overextended and defectively located, it possessed alarming weakness and was particularly vulnerable to an attack on its landward rear. Whereupon Beauregard forthwith declared that Columbus not meet the fate of Fort Donelson with the loss of the entire army, a hazard contrary to the art of war, and ordered Polk's pride and joy tore down. Kentucky was now abandoned by Confederate forces, and Union forces were beginning to move into Tennessee. When Confederate forces were massing to form the Army of the Mississippi at Corinth shortly before the Battle of Shiloh, we see the first glimpses of the rivalry between Braxton Bragg and Polk. The two were amicable before the war, but the longer serving Bragg grew irritated that Polk outranked him because the bishop had attained the rank of major general a few months prior to Bragg. Furthermore, the grumbling Bragg had served in the military for much longer than the minister and felt it was wrong for Polk to hold rank over him. Johnston would hear about this squabble and make Bragg his chief of staff so that Bragg could issue orders to Polk in the guise of orders from Johnston. The movement of the army out of Corinth toward Pittsburgh Landon caused havoc within the ranks as new commanders, not used to the movements of large armies, attempted to wrangle their regiments and brigades into place and along the correct paths. Beauregard singled out Polk and gave him a tongue lashing, blaming him for the delayed arrival of the army against Grant's troops. When the battle commenced on April 6th, Polk with the other corps commanders remained close to the front lines, especially when the tangled mass of brigades became separated from their divisions. A newspaper reporter described the scene involving Polk. Leonidas Polk, as ardent and enthusiastic a young soldier in his first skirmish, pushed forward his brave Tennesseans with his splendid batteries. A nobly appearing chief, he dashed along the lines, inspiring his men by his brave and self-possessed bearing. It wasn't all fighting for Polk and his troops. About midday, his men, ransacking the abandoned Union camps, found a delightful lunch. One soldier reported they all got a good dinner, already cooked which the well-supplied enemy had not time to eat in the morning. They fare far better than we do. We found an abundance of cheese, potatoes, dried fruit, honey, and almost every substantial that is intended for an army. 
It was many of Polk's units who attempted to extricate Union forces out of the now infamous Hornet's Nest. After the capture of those Union forces, Union General Prentiss's sword was handed over to Polk. The two armies bedded down on the night of the 6th, and Polk reportedly informed Beauregard that his headquarters would be near Benjamin Cheatham's bivouac location. Beauregard claimed that he was not given that information and at first thought he had been captured. On the morning of the 7th, he learned of Polk's whereabouts and wrote a scathing order to the bishop to plug the hole in the battle line caused by his absence. When Grant's army launched their counterattack, Polk and all their corps commanders got pushed back, leading to a depressing march back to Corinth for the rebels. While the army convalesced, Polk and his family had another tragedy befall them. Fanny and the children had moved to New Orleans when Nashville was captured, and not long after their arrival at New Orleans, Union forces captured it. Confederate citizens burned $2 million worth of cotton to prevent the Federal Army from capturing it, including Polk's harvest from the previous year kept at the warehouse. His cotton plantation in Mississippi would burn the baled cotton to keep it out of Union hands, financially sinking the family. The Army of the Mississippi moved to Tupelo, Mississippi, where Polk relaxed in camp, commenting to his family about the great setup that he had within the confines of Army life. But it was also in Tupelo where the wedge would be driven deeper between him and the newly appointed commander of the Army of the Mississippi, Braxton Bragg. Polk received orders to proceed to Jackson, Mississippi to preside over a court of inquiry against officers. This unsettled Polk, who felt that Braxton Bragg had conspired to do this in order to get him away from Corps Command. A few days later, the order was rescinded. Nonetheless, Polk and Bragg were fast becoming bitter enemies. It did not help the situation that Bragg vaguely referring to Polk described him as an old woman and utterly useless. In the summer of 1862, Union forces made movements from Nashville to Chattanooga, the all-important railroad hub of the Confederacy. Bragg would move his entire force from Tupelo to Chattanooga and from there devise a plan for the invasion of Kentucky to relieve the citizens of Tennessee and hopefully gain reinforcements from the southern sympathizers in the Bluegrass State. In late August, the Army of the Mississippi began their movement toward Kentucky. Working in conjunction with General Edmund Kirby Smith's Army of East Tennessee, which invaded Kentucky further to the east, Bragg spread out his forces between Bardstown, Harrodsburg, and Danville once Union General Don Carlos Buell concentrated at Louisville. A series of miscommunications and outright ignoring of orders between Bragg and Polk worsened the contempt each man had for the other. Polk disobeyed orders to move north in order to protect Frankfurt. Bragg grew concerned because he received reports that Buell's army was hastening to the capital. However, that movement was actually a diversion by Union forces, and the fact that Polk did not move the army allowed Bragg to confront the Union Army of the Cumberland at Perryville, Kentucky, and keep from being cut off from the South. This was not the only time that Bragg issued an order to Polk, and the bishop refused to do what he said. These altercations were the subject of a correspondence between Bragg and Davis a little later. Bragg stated, With all his ability, energy, and zeal, General Polk, by education and habit, is unfit for executing the orders of others. He will convince himself his own views are better and will follow them without reflecting on the consequences. Polk commanded much of the Confederate forces around Perryville until Bragg arrived. When the battle commenced, Polk took control of the right wing. As the fighting went into the night, some of the Arkansas troops heard from the other side of the field to stop firing, that they were firing on friends. Startled by the assertion, his men stopped firing. Polk rode up and the information was relayed to him but he had no aides to test out the situation. He determined that he himself would check to see if the information was true. The following account was how Polk described it to one of his soldiers. Polk started off on his faithful old roan Jerry to investigate for himself. Fortunately, his gray uniform was concealed by a linen duster, and favored by the gathering gloom, he rode to the officer standing a little to the right of the line and inquired, what troops are these? Promptly, the officer replied, the 22nd Indiana, Lieutenant Colonel Tanner commanding. General Polk was staggered only for a second when he at once replied, Colonel, cease firing. Don't you see you are firing into your own troops over there? Colonel Tanner blurted, I'm darn sure they are the enemy. Enemy, said Polk. Why, I have just left them myself. Cease firing, sir. But who are you to give this order? Inquired the Colonel. Bending over his horse's neck, Polk seized the Colonel roughly by the shoulder and remarked in his imperative manner, Cease fire in this instant, sir, or I will have you arrested and court-martialed for disobedience of orders in the enemy's front. This so staggered the colonel that he instantly gave the order, cease firing. General Polk then, with remarkable presence of mind, rode slowly down the line of the regiment 
until he gradually zigzagged his way back to his own lines. After the close encounter, Polk was asked what it was like being that close to enemy lines, and he replied, I felt like a thousand centipedes were traveling up and down my backbone. With the battle ending in a tactical victory but strategic defeat for the Confederacy and Kentucky not supplying the needed manpower expected by Bragg and Davis, the Army of the Mississippi, with the Army of Kentucky under Edmund Kirby Smith close behind, marched out of the Bluegrass State through the Cumberland Gap and toward Chattanooga. Thank you all so much for watching and supporting the channel. Please consider becoming a patron on the Patreon page and purchasing a t-shirt at the Teespring store. Both links are in the description below. Thank you all again. Have a great day. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. Have history will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the heartland. To educate the world. A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian